Hello everybody and welcome to CISVA Talks Trans. This is the second in our series of events and we've decided to focus on trans today um, because we are very excited to say we've struck a deal with Agenda about the fact that CISVA will now be LGBT rather than just LGB with them remaining as the experts. So we thought it was a good opportunity to explore the issues with you, help to raise awareness and give you the chance to ask any questions that you might have. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Ollie Empersall, I am the chair of CISRA and I will come to who these wonderful people are sat to my left and right in a short moment. Um, but what I wanted to do first of all uh, was go through a few bits of what I call parish news. So, number one, we are now LGBT, I have covered that. Um, just to give a bit more detail about how and why this has happened, uh, Jackie and I have been having conversations for a while about how do we support the people that have not or are currently undergoing gender reassignments, because they sort of fell between both of our organisations, particularly those who identified as non-binary or intersex, uh, and we decided that we do a lot of events that had traditionally been LGB, and we thought that that was a bit narrow. Um, we thought that a gender were the experts on trans issues, so we didn't want to undermine that. So what we thought we would do is we'd work closer together. We would open up all of our events like this to people who identify as trans, and a gender would continue to be the experts on all the technical and policy and support issues. The second bit of parish news is that we have recently conducted a recruitment exercise and we've expanded our team from 15 people to 60 people, which is fantastic and means that we will have a lot more capacity over the next year and hopefully longer to do the things that matter for you. So we'll be setting out a bit more detail in our forthcoming newsletters about what that means. Thirdly, we have been asked by permanent secretaries to gather together views on how the Stonewall Workplace Equality Index and Stonewall Diversity Champions Programme works for you. So we've been running a consultation with your network chairs, which you may have heard about. Um, we've got the results in from that now, and we will be publishing a short summary of those findings in one of our forthcoming newsletters, so do keep an eye out for that. The next thing to say is obviously World AIDS Day is less than a month away. It's coming up at the beginning of December. It's a very important day for our community and we want to know of any events that you are doing within your own department so that we can promote those as much as possible. So if you are doing anything, please email info at ukcsra.com with the details. And the final bit of parish news is to flag that after this event we will have our monthly networking drinks uh, this time they are in Bar Soho, which is, unsurprisingly, in Soho, on Old Compton Street. Uh, so please do join us straight after this event. So that's it in terms of news from us. In terms of the format of this event, we have four speakers. Uh, you will hear from each of them about a different aspects of their work and their experience. And I'll explain that when I introduce them. And then we will have a Q&A session directly afterwards. So if you've got any questions, do keep hold of them until all of the speakers have had their chance to uh, tell their stories to you. I should also say that the event is being recorded. It is being recorded from the computer over here, forward, so none of you are on the video. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, we don't want anybody being outed or anything like that happening. Um, but that is so that we can put highlights of this event on our web page for our staff that are based across the UK uh, so they can see it, basically. So, turning to the speakers, I'm going to do it in the QI style. So, on my left, far left, we have Becca Jeffrey. She is the Head of Transgender Policy in the Government Equalities Office. Sat next to her is Jackie Gavin, who many of you, I'm sure, know who is the former Chair of Agenda and currently working at the FCA. Uh, she is currently on comment there and will be coming back to Agenda shortly thereafter. Uh, on my right, we have Suzanne Semedo and we have Connie Barrett, 
who are from the Civil Service Workforce and Inclusion team in the Cabinet Office, and they exist to make the Civil Service better for everyone. So unsurprisingly, Becca will be starting us off with what is the government doing uh, about transgender policy. We'll then go to uh, Connie and Suzanne, who will take us through what the civil service is doing to support trans people. And finally, we'll go to Jackie, who's going to give more of the personal flavour <coughs> of what it's like being trans in the civil service and the good work that Agenda does. And the final thing to say is that we are going to use the term trans as an umbrella term in this event. I know there are many different terms that can be used, transgender, transsexual, uh, non-binary, intersex, etc. Um, but for ease, we're calling uh, this event Scissor Talks Trans. So that's enough from me. I'm now going to pass the microphone over to Becca, who's going to talk about the wonderful work that the government is doing to support trans people. Becca. Hello, thank you very much, Ollie. And I just want to say thanks, um, everyone, for inviting me along today. But just a quick introduction to um, me. I am... Um, fairly new member of the Government Equalities Office. I've been there for a year and a very new member of the LGBT team and very lucky to work for Ollie, so no pressure on me today. <laughs> um, I, I've been working as Head of Transgender Policy for about two months, so I'm still very much in learning and listening um, um, mode. And so if I do get any of the language or terminology wrong, then please just free, feel free to correct me and apologies if I do um, make any mistakes with that. Um, also, very happy to answer questions at the end. Again, if I can't answer all the technical ones, I can get back to you um, after consulting with my expert, Kevin, who, who works with me and my team. Um, so I thought, could we have the next slide? Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder of what the Government Equalities Office is, for anyone who doesn't know and is not familiar with us. Um, so we are a small and perfectly formed policy unit that has moved around government and is currently in the Department of Education. Um, there are about 50 of us at the moment, but we are expanding. Um, we are we're leading proactively on um, three key equalities policy areas on sexual orientation, transgender and gender. And we also have a team that maintains and looks after the equalities, equalities legis legislative framework and sponsors the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. Um, it's a team that's responsible for topics such as gender, pay gap, uh, it was also responsible for same-sex marriage um, legislation. Next slide, thank you. And this is a quick just reminder of who our ministers are. So we have um, uh, Justin Greening, who's come to us from DFID recently, and we have kept, in the, in the recent shuffle, Caroline Dynage as well. Next slide. And so, just um, we only got ten minutes. So obviously, this area is very kind of complex and wide ranging. So this is going to be very quick, canter through, and um, you know, happy to do uh, any kind of talk in the in the future uh, um, about transgender equality in more detail and give it kind of a um, bit more attention than it deserves. But um, just on legislation. So on the whole. The UK compares well with other countries on trans equality, um, and this is largely down to the legislative framework that we have offering um, protection for transgender people. So there are key uh, current; these are the key current pieces of legislation, and it's not a history of um, uh, legislation making over time. Um, pieces, four pieces listed here, are owned by the Government Equalities Office and the Ministry of Justice. First is the Equality Act uh, 2010, and this act recognises gender reassignment as a protected characteristic um, and giving legal protection, <coughs> which is designed to prevent discrimination against transgender people. Um, and this has gone some way to improve the lives of trans people in the UK um, and acts to encourage employers and service providers to take into account uh, their needs. Then we have the Gender Recognition Act, which allows transgender people to change legal gender, change a legal gender, and obtain a gender recognition certificate. Um, under the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act, um, a trans person in marriage can now gain legal recognition of their acquired gender without having to dissolve marriage. 
And then we have <coughs> uh, the Criminal Justice Act 2003. Um, recently in 2012, this provided a sentence of uplift, which increased the length of sentences for those convicted of hate crime, which is directed at transgender people. Slide. And then in, in addition to legislation, there have been some non-legislative actions that government's taken, and this doesn't cover everything that we've done, but just a few key actions. So in 2011, government um, published the world's first trans transgender equality <coughs> action plan, which covered 103 commitments um, from across government, and highlights of that plan included um, hate crime guidance for all police officers, um, and then reforming Ofsted school inspections um, to give all forms of prejudice-based bullying more prominence. Oh no, it's, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> um, so then, we have also, the Government Equalities Office in, uh, last year published guidance for employers, employers and services uh, providers. Um, and this is designed to support the legislation and help employers act more sensitively to help retain and recruit transgender people. Um, this year we announced £2.8 million pounds for um, an anti-HBT, homophobic, biphobic and transphobic bullying projects. Um, so these projects um, were, are going to start their work next year uh, the awardees are currently working with schools to figure out um, which, which schools across the country they're going to work with. So just a few highlights. Um, some of you may be aware of um, quite a high profile and very wide ranging inquiry by the Women and Equalities Select Committee, which happened last year and then reported in January um, of this year. Um, so this was actually very influential for shaping government's and our current work programme. Um, and it made a lot of recommendations for government about actions it needs to take to um, build on the progress so far that we've made on transgender equality. It made 35 recommendations for us across a whole range of areas. And some of those areas are um, legislation, social services, um, healthcare and other frontline services. Um, it's um, really interesting, very powerful um, look at uh, the experiences of transgen transgender people in this country and it's definitely worth reading if you have a, um, have a chance to. Um, so particular concerns were around existing legislation, um, around the Equality Act um, and also the Gender Recognition Act, and the committee were concerned that these pieces of legislation were not quite up to date enough and needed looking at in terms of the level of um, bureaucracy and um, smoothness of the process, especially around the gender recognition process. On healthcare, uh, key concerns were on improving the training for NHS staff, um, and also concerns around the service specification for gender identity and children and, and young people services. Um, we're also kind of aware about a lot of concern around waiting times for first appointments for gender identity clinics, and that was raised in the reports. There were also focuses on criminal justice system and concerns around the way we deal with hate crime and the treatment of transgender offenders. So that was a really useful report because it's helped to provide some focus to our work. And this is a range of actions that we're taking. So in July 2016, government published the response to the report. And within that response, we committed to reviewing the Gender Recognition Act and looking at the process, especially in relation to demedicalizing the process and streamlining it to make it a bit less bureaucratic. Um, we're also looking into an internal review of the unnecessary use of gender markers in, in official documents. 
we um, Government Equalities Office works in the Department of Education now, so we um, work alongside social workers' teams, and work is currently underway to um, have a think and a bit of a research into what the current levels of knowledge are um, amongst social workers um, working in, in children's services on transgender issues. <coughs> Um, a huge amount of work is going on with, um, led by NHS England and a few other um, um, bodies related to the Department of Health on provision of services. Um, so especially on commissioning gender identity services. Um, also the Royal College of Nursing recently um, produced a guide for nursing and healthcare professionals um, on, how, on how to best care for trans people. Um, prisons review work, um, so a, a review by the Ministry of Justice uh, recently concluded that treating offenders in the gender in which they identify with is the most effective starting point for safety and reducing offending. Um, and we also want to do a lot more work on the evidence base around transgender issues. Um, there is, it's not always necessarily easy to get um, sort of robust evidence around trans issues. So work is underway um, in a range, of, a range of areas, but um, in particular, we have recently got a few extra questions into the British Social Attitude, Attitudes Survey to get our first set of baseline data for attitudes towards transgender people. So we look forward to getting that and building on that. And, and yeah, as previously, previously mentioned, we're also continuing our work on strengthening and delivering on anti-HPT um, bullying projects across the country. We look forward to building on those. So there's a lot going on. And I would be really interested when we get to Q&A on just kind of thoughts from the audience on those things, um, especially in terms of your ideas on level of prioritisation um, what government should be focusing on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Becca. That was very interesting. Um, we're now going to move on to uh, the civil service and what the civil service is currently doing to support trans people. So I'm going to probably pass both microphones, I think, over to Connie and Suzanne, who are going to do a bit of a double act, hopefully in style of Lowell and Hardy. Yeah. Um, I feel a bit of pressure there today. <laughs> That's some sort of comedy routine, <coughs> suddenly there. But uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I have to say it's a privilege to be here uh, and meet with you today. My name is Suzanne Tomato. Um, my role is Head of Policy within the Cabinet Office Civil Service Diversity Inclusion Team. That team essentially, it's put a mouthful, but we are part of the Workforce Strategy Inclusion Team, which looks to progress the diversity and inclusion agenda across the civil service, so quite encompassing all of the approximately 400,000 staff that form part of our sector. Um, so as part of this uh, well, um, into, um, presentation, myself and Colin will just talk you through what we're doing within the civil service. So I'll take it from the more strategic work that we're doing at the DNI generally and leave my, my colleague to focus particularly on issues affecting um, transgender, intersex and non-binary employees. But um, some time ago, some of you might be aware that in 2015, we came up with a Refresh Talent Action Plan, which identified various um, activities that we we're going to take forward within the civil service to progress diversity and inclusion, with the main uh, push being that we needed to see greater diversity happening throughout the organisation and recognising there were areas where we as you mentioned, Rebecca, there's areas where the evidence base, even in terms of the number of levels of representation, will also work out low. So really needing a big push on that. Since the time of the introduction of that talent action plan, we were able to refine it from a number of initiatives to focus around four strands of work. Um, and that is around recruitment and selection, 
So looking at the process that we use to recruit and select and making sure that's accessible. And we've seen a lot of work around that doing about um, removing, um, for example, use of pronouns, etc., within a fast shoe recruitment, for example, to in in increase work around that. We're also working around talent and progression, increasing accessibility to those programmes and ensuring that enables those people who want promotion, because not all of us might be interested in that, but for those people who ha want promotion and have the potential to progress can have the opportunity for doing so. <laughs> um, social mobility, um, which was an area where there was le that which was less well known, but from the uh, research that we conducted, we recognised that the civil service, particularly in its fast stream, was less diverse than Oxbridge. So needing to do some real work to um, ensure that we have greater accessibility there. And as part of that work, that means a lot more outreach work to diverse communities to encourage and to see the civil service as an employer of the choice. And hopefully that means that a diverse employer chat. So really, really so, uh, outreach to many students, uh, different areas of the student bodies in a variety of universities. And then finally, um, um, area which I think is also very relevant here, is around inclusive culture. So we've heard about the strategies and the legislation, but it doesn't really mean anything unless it's part of the lived experience of civil servants. So within the inclusive culture strand, the primary fo primary focus at that time was around looking at bullying, harassment and discrimination, where we know from the current monitoring there's a real um, gap in experiences of LGB employees compared to other employees within the civil service, so a big push around that. As part of the Talent Action Plan, uh, by March this year, we realised there were other things that needed to be looked at. One, addressing that gap in evidence specifically, and I'll let Connie expand on what we're actually doing to increase our knowledge around the experience of trans employees, but also um, is looking forward to embed our work around diversity inclusion within the <coughs> wider work and the workforce reform. So the um, plan that you see in there, the workforce plan, takes us up to 2020, and as part of that, there's a particular strand in there which says that we want to make the civil service the most inclusive employer and we want to make the civil service a great place to work now for those colleagues who have worked here a couple of decades please don't grow uh, um, it's something that we know for some areas is a part of the lived experience but we really want to uh, set our sights high and ensure that different departments can be monitored and held to account of how their how their employees are experiencing um, their time within the civil service so i'll hand over to connie Thank you, Suzanne. So just to introduce myself, my name is Connie Barrow and I lead on LGBT and I policy in the DNI team. Um, so can we have the next slide? Please? Thank you. So I'm just going to take you through a little bit about what the civil service is actually doing, what we're focusing on in the team working with CISRA, Age and Dar and various other staff networks. So can we have another click? The first important aspect we've been looking at is gender identity monitoring. So at the moment we're holding a conversation, a consultation with heads of diversity, heads of staff networks, LGBT champions, which is and this is very championed by Sue Owen as well, also trade unions are involved. Um, we put together research from various different reports, so looking at best practice across the public and the private sector. And we put a few different options out to departments for comments. You probably might have heard this fed down from your networks. Um, Second, um, just so the departments that are already looking to have a combined SOP system, um, I've been in conversation with those systems, so it, they're very, very open to changes in the gender identity monitoring space. Um, the, next, the next area is looking at bullying harassment, looking at what makes us a brilliant civil service, linking into the civil service vision. So looking at promoting inclusion in the regions particularly, so this would be allowing regions to have more exposure to the diversity champions, particularly Sue Owen and as overall diversity champion, LGBT champion. Um, so this work would be to reduce bullying, harassment and, disc and discrimination in the regions and increase the visibility of staff networks. Also looking at champions and engagement in the future strategy for diversity inclusion. Um, we're looking at putting together a programme of visits for Sue Owen so she can go speak to people about these issues and um, look to involve other champions to increase intersectionality as well. Um, the next 
photo is a widely talked about subject from what I've been hearing in my first two months into the role. Um, as a result of a few PQs that have been flying around that I've had recently, um, it's worth mentioning that the government property unit has developed some guidance, or some government hub guidance, that recommends that all departments that are looking to change buildings or refurbish their buildings, they're encouraged to introduce gender neutral toilets into those. Um, some departments I've heard, including the Home Office, are looking to put this in already. And this was also widely praised at the Fast Stream induction event as well. So the speakers were not just pointing to the male and the female toilets, they were pointing to the toilets as a whole. It was just, it was a really good experience. I had some good feedback. Um, the final part is looking to do some more research into intersex and non-binary. So not just looking at the trans LGBT space as a whole, but going a little bit wider. Um, we've committed to doing this in the town action plan and we are looking to kind of scope this work at the moment so watch this space we'll be doing some work on this very soon um, that was the kind of main four things that we're going to be covering and I'm sure Suzanne and I will be very happy to take any questions at the end Thank you very much to both Connie and Suzanne uh, for that insight into what the civil service is doing. Uh, we're now going to pass over to Jackie, who's going to talk a little bit about her experience in the civil service and the work of Agent. Thank you, Ali. Hello. Hello. No, come on. Hello. Hello. Charlotte. <laughs> Thank you. For those of you that don't know me, and I'm looking out and thinking, who don't I know? But... As you know, my name is Jackie Gadden. I'm the former chair of the Cross Civil Service Network, Agender. I say former because, as Ollie rightly said, I've just been sent out on secondment to the Financial Conduct Authority, maybe for, for, perhaps to keep me out of the way and to keep me being good for a change instead of trying to cause a nuisance for myself. But I still consider myself to be a civil servant and a proud civil servant. I also consider myself to be a civil servant with an attitude and before anybody says anything I've already copyrighted that aspect because believe me I am like to have that attitude. Attitude because I believe in what we're about. Attitude because I believe it's the right thing to do and attitude because I want to ensure that whoever identifies as transgender in any way shape or form or as intersex is supported as best you can. And a great thing about networks as well, particularly some like Agenda and CISRA and any of your own individual department of staff networks, they do offer as much information as you want. But the only thing I would push back on that is it's only as good as what you put into it yourselves. That is one of the main key things that I would push back in any sort of space. But for me, I've got to also think about what it was like when I joined a civil service. I mean, I've just heard what Ollie said about being a civil servant. I consider myself to be a civil service novice, and that basically means I've got between five and ten years service. We'll call it seven for argument's sake. And that, on that basis, when I joined the civil service, I did not have a clue what to expect. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what it was going to be about. But suddenly, my experience was about thinking, what can I do? Because, to say, when I think about my experience of thinking what the civil service was about, I think back to programmes like, so, yes, Prime Minister or yes, Minister, and thinking, this is the way it's going to be in the civil service. But no, it wasn't that way. It was great to see that the civil service was about supporting colleagues, supporting staff, and having aspects of staff networks that fell into that space. But... I still also felt that despite that, being somebody who's transgender and thinking back to my own career, I was thinking, I'm going to be outed, I'm going to be found out. And when I look at my CV, my CV is a bit like a patchwork quilt. I had a job here for a couple of years because I was there before being outed. I had a job there and then I was outed again. And it was again and again and again and again. And this is the longest job I've actually had as I said, seven years, and I'm pr pretty damn proud of that aspect. But as I see, when I, the one thing I want to think about my first staff members was in the Warrington Pension Centre. 
when my viewpoint of the Warrington was, it was personally felt that there was no diversity in that space, because the majority of the colleagues were 99.99% white, mid to late 40s, built like rugby <coughs> league players, and spoke with a harsh Scouse and a Manc accent. But maybe that's my sort of unconscious bias coming to the fore. I felt a little bit out of my depth, but hey, I say I can't let my unconscious bias rule what I'm about. As I walked into that room for that very first diversity meeting, I felt, what do I say? What do I do? He asked me, say, well, come on, tell us about yourself. As I said, my name's Jackie and I'm from Lynn. That's the posh big of Warrington for people that don't know it. <laughs> Never a good thing to make you come from Lynn because believe me, especially in Warrington, oh, no, 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 no. Anyway, that's my unconscious bias so again, getting in the way of me. Then came the actual question about what area of diversity are you interested in? And I said, oh, I'm interested in LGBT. And I say anti because we must make sure we get that correct. People now confused looked at their faces and thought, well, how on earth is this person interested in LGBT? She's at home, she's got a husband. Why should she be interested in LGBT? Why are you interested in it? Like, no, I'm more interested in the actual T bit of that acronym. Even more questions. Why on earth is this person interested in the T aspect? I suddenly thought I had to shut my eyes here and say, because I want to just do something for transgender expecting some sort of reaction and some sort of message to come back. As I opened my eyes, it was a case of, finally, somebody here to talk about transgender issues. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, really? They're all talking about Man United versus Manchester City or Liverpool versus Everton. Best team being at Man United, of course, but hey, we won't get into that argument today. Thank you. <laughs> As I say, it sounds like something pretty amazing. But then, as I say, the next thing was even more amazing. After a few weeks, I found myself being pushed down to a transgender network over the road at Methodist Hall, run by some organisation I'd never heard of it before in my life, some organisation called Agender. What the heck is Agender? And I went along to that event and I thought, suddenly, I found something where I can join in. I think at that event, there was probably about 700 people. It was absolutely incredible to see that whole aspect. And yes, they were bickering. Yes, they were arguing. That's how highly unusual transgender people I know. But hey, it was a place where I suddenly felt I could get into a connection. Before I got that invite, however, I got a phone call on, in the contact centre where I was working. And my line manager shouted to me, Jackie, I've got a call for you. Some guy called Terry Moran. Now, those of you who may know Terry Moran, Terry Moran used to be the former Director General of PDCS, or Pensions Dis Disability and Carer Service, then went on to become second parent sec for DWP. Couldn't hear a pin drop. Everybody was like, she's got a call from Terry Moran. And Terry came on the phone and said, yeah, Jackie, we know all about you. <laughs> yeah, we well, want you to set up a transgender specific network in the DWP. Okay. Yeah, okay, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Then I next thing I knew, I had about 80 or 90 people around me about me saying, what the heck do you want to do with the second grand sec of DWP? <laughs> but it was a real joy to be able to be able to set up that network in its early stages. Get it into a place where everybody felt included from the transgender perspective, and I say everybody from the transgender perspective. That was back in 2000, end of 2009, beginning of 2010, and we included everybody who fell under that trans umbrella. The queer, the fluid, the non-binary, the trans bedside, call it what you will, whatever language you want to use, but everybody was included in that space. But sadly, sometimes and of course, we've seen this experience where, unfortunately, due to austerity, we lost that aspect. We lost the networks because DWP went back to a stage where we had to have a quality hub. Now, that is, was fine. But one of the most important things that I found from a staff support network, and I'm glad to say that DWP has come back to the fore 
and has now got its own specific LGBT network, DW Pride, which was launched last Monday. And it's fantastic to be back in that space and back being a real, real voice for those trans people, because trans people need a voice as much as LGB people need a voice, as much as intersex people need a voice. We need to give everybody an opportunity to be themselves. And I believe that a gender can still do that. And I believe that working in partnership with CISRA, working in partnership with the Central DNI team, working in partnership with people like Susuo and even your own individual departmental networks is the future and what we need to do is be in this space together. So I want to say it. Thank you, Jackie. It's really good to hear the personal story. And I'm really pleased that the civil service has treated you so well that you stayed with us for so long, and long may that continue. And we're now going to open up to questions from the audience. We're going to use a roving mic, um, which Rebecca is going to hand around. Um, we'll take them one at a time, because my memory cannot cope with more than one question. Um, so who wants to go first? What was the difficult thing to do? Gemma. And why not? <laughs> um, my question is actually for Rebecca, and it is about the um, review of the GRN. Uh, do we have a sort of timeline on that, uh, especially with reference to the GRC? Uh, no, so thanks for your question. No, we don't have a fixed timetable yet. Um, obviously, um, government is figuring out what its legislative timetable is going to be across the whole of all other policies and areas. So we're in conversation with um, the relevant departments at the moment, um, and we'll just have to figure out something that is manageable. But I, I am assuming that the ambition is to do it within this um, um, current parliament. Okay, next question is coming from Charlotte. <laughs> Don't worry, Jackie, I'm not going to put you on the spot like I normally do. Uh, my, my question is actually for the Cabinet Office team. Um, being a uh, people serving manager, I know it uh, closed the other day, um, we still don't ask a question around um, gender identity in the people survey. Is that something you're definitely exploring for next year's people survey? Yes, so that's kind of... So I've had a lot of queries about it as well. So it's something that we're looking to implement for the next people survey. Hopefully I've been in contact with the people survey team and analysis and insight. So they work across the civil service who develop the people survey. And so at the, what it is, is they work with the ONS statistics. So they use all those questions because they've been kind of psychologically tested and everything. But the ONS also look to do a review of their census questions. So they're looking to review their gender fields and stuff like that, so we're, that is something that we're working alongside with them on, so following their policy as well. So yes, we are looking to do something for the next people survey. Hopefully it happens. Okay, I have um, a question that has been submitted in advance, and this is one for Jackie. What's the one thing that you would like the civil service to do to better support trans people? In all honesty, I think it's about the consistency. I think, I mean, we've now got the central team and hopefully we can get there with the HODs and people like that, is to have a viewpoint that represents all of us in this space and is that consistent point where there is a central place where the information can be done. So whether you work for DWP, whether you work for, is it BIS or BIS, um, or wherever you actually are, in the civil service, that you are supported in a consistent way. That's the main thing I would think. Thank you. Any more from the audience? Don't be shy. <laughs> um, I'm just interested in um, the representation of trans across different grades within the civil service. So I know, for example, in Ministry of Justice, we have 52% women, but that's very much weighted towards the lower grades. Do you find similar patterns or anything you could share um, trans-related? 
Um, so I think the first thing to say is that because we don't monitor, we don't know. Um, obviously, a gender is probably best place uh, to give some insight because they know their membership. So I might, again, pass to Jackie on this one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really can't give you an honest answer on that, to be perfectly honest. I think the main thing that we need to do in part of the process as part of doing these kind of organ thing, these kind of talks and things like that, is to give the trans people the confidence to be themselves, to be their authentic self, to be proud of who they are. And when we come to do the actual monitoring aspect, if it gets to the point, we know it will take, take time for people to be put their hand up, because a lot of people might not want to be identified as being transgender. But if it gives people that confidence to be themselves, to be out about themselves, we can begin to start to make the difference a bit like sexual orientation, a bit like race, a bit like any other protective characteristic. That is the key thing I would say that we need to get to. So can I just in the meantime fill in in terms of that representation point. The um, vision we have in terms of our consultation on gender monitoring is that once we get that feedback on to, in terms of the right appropriate questions to ask, that it will not, it will not only impact the people survey but how we approach our uh, representation and the monitoring um, that we gather more generally so uh, hopefully in doing that we can eventually perhaps get some of the uh, data that we need okay so that's got the microphone um my own very very simply sticking with the monitoring question one of the issues that i could see you having is that a lot of people who the Gender Recognition Act Equality Act were written for, those people of classical transition from one to another, no longer consider themselves as being transgender once they've finished transition. Do you have anything built into your proposed monitoring systems that would actually allow for that? So, from a government-wide perspective, this is one of the issues that we are grappling with on monitoring. We realise that it's an area with quite a high level of complexity. We've been discussing with ministers what we can do in terms of research and engagement with trans people to understand how best they would like us to ask the questions. We're at the start of that journey. There is a way to go, but we are looking into it. Um, just from the kind of general research that we've been doing in the central team, um, so in this consultation document, we've put out different options. So also part of this is included a free text box, so people can identify however they want to. But if they, it's at the end of the day, we've got to give people, we can't force people to depend on their transgender, but it gives them the option. If of course, obviously we're dealing with a lot of different views on this, so they it just gives people the opportunity. But like Ollie said, we're just looking into it with various research and stuff, so hopefully we can get an approach that suits everyone. Okay, question, yes. Uh, hi, um, so I'm really pleased to hear that um, you're planning on uh, doing more monitoring and actually um, at Bayes we had a look at the proposals today, so you'll get some news from us. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I also think it's excellent to hear that the next step in the plan is to do kind of um, look at the representation across grades. Um, my question is around, I guess, I think this, we are talking about potentially relatively small numbers, particularly by department, um, and I just wondered kind of what your thinking is on, I guess, to be technical dealing with statistical significance, but also to be less technical kind of dealing with the impression that people may feel exposed or that they might be revealing information about themselves individually, and kind of how you might deal with that as you roll this out. Well, that's part of the challenge that we have for monitoring generally. Um, but there's the thing that I ask myself when thinking about this inclusion agenda is thinking, well, there is something about the numbers, and there's also something about us asking, uh, getting into talking to colleagues and asking the stuff that we should be doing anyway, and not wait for the numbers to tell us the stuff that we should just be getting on and doing. So. Moving forward, what I'm quite passionate about is being able to have that time and consider scoping out research where we can ask colleagues about their experience, get that feedback, um, 
and then use that as a way of them moving forward. So hopefully that we won't get too tangled uh, up in the, um, the statistical element. Can I just add to that? I'm sorry, um, also from base. Um, I, I get what you're saying and that's really important, but can we have some clear guidance on that or a line on that? Because I know for sure this department as well, I'm sure many other departments are heavily relied on data. And so if we don't, if we don't present what people will believe as statistically significant data, then it won't necessarily be taken seriously. So if, if that's your approach, that's absolutely great. I agree with that too. But if we could have a line from Cabinet Office in particular on that kind of thing, that would be helpful. I mean, there's one thing to say that um, the primary mechanism for gathering this data is through the Civil Service People Survey. That is anonymous. It is also the case that data is not available in its raw form to managers. It's also a case that where the sample is too small, this is not published. So there are quite a few important safeguards in place already to make sure that people aren't exposed. I think the other thing I would add <coughs> is that with monitoring, you have to create the environment where people feel, A, that the information is safe, and B, that it's going to be used in a, in a proper way. I think we've got a bit of work to do on the first of those points. And I think we can continue to get the messages out to people about the safeguards and how the data is going to be used. I think also the more that we talk about these issues, the more that we raise awareness, I think the safer people will feel. So there's a bit of work to be done around this to make sure that the information is used appropriately and that people feel safe in giving it. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? I'll just add one quick thing. Um, and also, just by doing this work as well, we've realised that it is going to be a bit of a culture change in the civil service. So it's all about getting used to having people get used to answering the questions and not so not asking for too much information. So whether this is just simply having a male, female, transgender, insect, other kind of system or any other system that works, just to kind of have people to be confident but not outing themselves in any possible way. And also most definitely prefer not to say. So if people don't want to say, that's absolutely fine. But it's the individual's choice if they want to or not. Okay, we've got time for one last question, if anybody has one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, simple one. I mean, you've brought in anonymous recruiting recently. And you've got lots of people who love to join the civil service. However, they get through the anonymous recruiting part and then they come on their face-to-face -face interviews. And as has been previously mentioned, you've got the old guard civil service. But a lot of them are actually managers at the moment who are then saying, hmm, not too sure if I want to take a risk here because their opinions are older opinions perhaps. And although they pay lip service to the new civil service way of working, perhaps they don't actually think that way. How do you plan to do something about that? Right, um, well that's that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> so in the other videos. I mean we have kind of done the classic thing of unconscious bias training etc. We know that's not enough. Um, part of it comes back also to that monitoring question. Part of it comes up to also um, instead of greater levels of accountability um, feeling that when people are making decisions through the various stages of recruitment, it's now think, working with civil service resourcing to think about what levers we can pull to monitor the diversity that's happening through that process. Um, some of it is also about culture change and awareness raising. So unfortunately there isn't a silver bullet to this kind of issue. It's really part of the wider work that we're having to do around culture change and the stuff that we're looking to achieve on diversity inclusion more generally that will feed this. But um, in tackling this problem, uh, tackling these issues as we move forward, that's where working collaboratively with CISRA, Agenda and colleagues and kind of going out for feedback and consultation to get that test of how things work is going to be really essential to us. Also, just to add from a CISRA perspective, we are looking into options at the moment, what we can do, particularly with the senior civil service, to try and get more allies on board and to also try and celebrate the successful role models that we have, whether they be LGB or T or not. 
um, outstanding, for example, do some really good work with the private sector about celebrating the success of the really top brass uh, in the private sector who do a lot of work in the space and really champion change. We are looking into doing something similar in the civil service. And by doing that, so by celebrating the success and showcasing the work people do, that will help to change the culture. It won't be a quick fix, but hopefully it will make a difference over time. OK, so we are at the end of our time. Um, just a few thank yous uh, before we finish. <coughs> First of all, I would like to thank each of our speakers for their wonderful insights today. It was great to hear from Becca about the work that the government is doing. It was equally good to hear about the work the civil service is doing uh, from Suzanne and Connie, and I thought they answered your difficult questions particularly well. And it was, as ever, excellent to hear from Jackie on her personal insights in life in the civil service as a trans person. I'd also like to thank Rebecca, who has been not only our roving mic person, but the person that's actually made this event happen. She's booked everything, she's done all the publicity work with our comms manager, John, who also deserves thanks. Um, and without those two, this event wouldn't have happened. So a big thank you to all of those people. Thank you. Okay, so our time is up. We're now going to head to Bar Soho. Um, the next of these events will be taking place in the new year because we work every two months. Um, we will be publishing details of our programme of these uh, for 2017 soon. So do keep checking our website. And if you don't know what it is, it is ukcsra.com. But that is all from us. Thank you.